So it's been a while since I made any videos using my IKEA hobo stove. So I thought I'd just take a few minutes to show you what I've done with it and why I think I may have reached the ultimate in performance with it. If you're interested, keep watching. So before we begin, I thought I'd just take a minute to explain what it is I want to do today. So to begin with, I do have a series of videos on my channel, which I'll put a link to up in the corner, as well as at the end of this video, showing how to make your own IKEA hobo stove from one of their utensil strainers. Now, the videos are quite long, but that's because they have a lot of detail. You're welcome to skip through them or pick out what you feel you want to. And I'm also going to encourage you to add your own comments and your own design suggestions to those videos videos because I will see those and if I make yet another video I'll include those in that video as well. The other thing I wanted to do was to ask this question of you and that is, is IKEA still making this utensil strainer? So I've been looked on the IKEA Canada website and I can't seem to find it anymore. Now I have no trouble picking them up secondhand at our thrift stores, so they're still around. But if anyone knows for sure whether or not IKEA is still making the utensil strainer, please put that in the comment section below. And if they're not, does anybody have a good alternative that we can use to make hobo stoves from in future videos. All right, so what I'm going to do is take you down to the tabletop. I'm going to go over where I'm at with the current design, and then I'm going to show you what I've done to get the ultimate performance out of it. So this is the current version of my IKEA hobo stove cook system that I carry most often. I do have other systems and other stove designs, but this is the one I've put together and one I want to demonstrate to you today. Right now I have it in a stuff sack that I made myself from material that I picked up at one of our thrift stores. And that is actually a part of the whole design philosophy for this cook kit. Because everything inside of here has been either been DIY made myself or modified from items that I picked up at a thrift store or other items that I picked up very inexpensively. And I'm going to take this apart and show you what I've got in here in a moment. But before I do, I just want to take you back to the videos that I mentioned a minute ago where I took, well, took the time and extensively went into how to build an IKEA hobo stove and so much detail that it ended up in three videos. Yes, I know they're quite long, but like I said, you can go through them and pick out what it is you want. I want to point out that there is an alternative for all the work that I showed in those videos for making your own hobo stove, and that is simply to purchase a set of the Siege Stove cross members and add them to a utensil strainer. I honestly, it does not get any simpler or more simple than this, and I don't know that I can make anything any more effective than this. So yes, it does cost you a little bit of money to purchase those siege stove pieces, but you can use it not only with the utensil strainer, but you can use it with any number of paint cans, tin cans, you know, food grade cans, and make a, a hobo stoves. I just happen to like how well it turns the strainer into a hobo stove. No cutting, nothing necessary at all. All right, we're going to put that aside because I do have a video demonstrating how the seed stove can turn a hobo or make a, a KO utensil strainer into a hobo stove. So if you're interested, you can go back and see how that works. All right, back to the kit. So let's remove it from the stuff sack. And I'm going to be taking it out in components because there's a number of things in here. And then I'll demonstrate what each component is for. Quite a bit of stuff in here. There we go. And one last thing. So let's start with the stove itself. Take all the components out. Yes, there's a lot in here. Uh, these are some of these are optional components that I'm going to be showing you. Just uh, you know, multiple ways of doing the same thing, so that I just put them all inside of the same kit. But let's get down to the basics. So here is my utensil strainer with the hole cut in the side. I'm going to talk about feed holes in a minute, but in a, another video that I made not too long ago, I had shown some of the updates I had made for the stove, and I'll, I'll just go quickly go over those now. So for the bottom of the stove, I did purchase these. They weren't expensive, and it's worth doing. These are one-inch conduit clamps, and I picked them up at the hardware store. They fold in, fold out, and they make great feet now. It has been suggested to me by viewers, and you're right, I just haven't gotten around to do it, that what I'm doing right now by tightening those feet up with the little 
Uh, nuts on the bottom would be made a lot easier if I got some wing nuts. Uh, yeah, they would. <laughs> they would make it a lot easier. I just haven't gotten around to doing that because it's still functioning very well for me. So you can see the feet roll out and they extend the width of the base, making it that much more stable. For the top bars, in an earlier video, I had uh, an experience where a strong crosswind had caused the aluminum crossbars that I had to actually start to melt and warp and fall back into the, into the uh, container itself. Now, two things here. One, I've determined aluminum is not a great material for using. It's, it will work most of the time, but if you get a strong wind and a really hot fire, it is going to melt the aluminum. The other thing was the effect that the wind had on this in terms of robbing away heat. So what did I turn to? Stainless steel rulers from Walmart. So a stainless steel ruler measure out what, what you need to do and you can go back to the video if you're interested in knowing how I made that and you make yourself a set of crossbars. And these have had no problem handling the heat whatsoever. And I actually like them a little bit better because they're a little bit taller than the ones that I had been using. So I got a little bit more clearance, a little bit more room for air exhaust to come out of the top of the stove. And I can actually just feed wood in through the top if I want. So let's just talk about feeding wood into the stove. So this is the design that I have... Uh, I wouldn't say settled on because there's any number of ways you could do this and in fact I don't think it's necessary to have a feed port anymore and I'll explain what I mean in a moment. So I did start by building a feed port that had a low design like the Emberlid stove. In fact that's what I modeled it on was a, a hole down near the bottom for feeding sticks in like the Emberlid stove had. And then I made another one that had a, had a port way up near the top like the Bushcraft Essential stove. Um, you know what? They both work just fine. I don't, can't say that one was that much better than the other. And then I made a third design that had two ports in it. One down low, a little smaller than this one, and one up slightly higher, also smaller than this one. And they were set off at 45 degrees to each other so that I could feed sticks in from two sides, like the firebox stove. All of them worked. All, I can't say one was any better than the other, but here's where I'm at with this right now. I don't think it's necessary to do any cutting at all because most of the time when I am using the IKEA stove now, I'm preloading it, stacking all my wood in up on a, on a vertical stance like this, building a fire on top, putting my, my pot stands on top, and it's only necessary to refuel if I really need an extended burn. And then it's just as easy to fill in, throw in a few sticks from the top. That's just an option to make it easier for you that if you don't want to have to find some way of cutting out a hole, don't bother. Just build your stove without it and it's, it'll work just fine. As you can see, there's plenty of room. Okay, so that's the stove. Now, a couple of things that I wanted to point out. One is if you have a pot, now, I, of course, I, I'll put the, the sizes for the IKEA stove uh, utensil strainer in the show notes below because that's going to be important for the future step that we're going to look at in a minute. But I was able to find a pot at our thrift store which was just like a giant mug. It does have a handle on the outside. Yes, it does have a plastic knob, but that has not been an issue. I use this a lot. I think that probably shows quite well. I use this a lot, not just with this stove, but with a lot of other stoves. It's, it's a great pot, and you know, I don't think I paid more than $1.50, $2 for it. Not only does it work well on top of the IKEA Hobo stove, but the IKEA Hobo stove fits well down inside of it just by folding it all the way and down in it goes. Now it doesn't allow for the lid to go on uh, on top, but I don't see that as much of an issue. And I have videos using this to cook with as well. Okay, so where am I at with the stove? Well, using it with wood is pretty self-evident and I'm not gonna go over the use with it for, with wood right now. I do have a demonstration that I'll do before the end of the video. But I want to talk about alternative fuels for use in this stove. And I have used it with wood pellets, and I have used it with charcoal, and I have used it with alcohol very effectively. Uh, I'm not a fan of solid fuel. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I think if you watch my other videos, you'll know that I don't use solid fuel very much because I just don't like the performance that it gives. 
so what do I want to talk about is how I've come up with some alternative ways of using this first off with wood pellets and at the same time with alcohol. So using it with wood pellets, what I wanted to do was come up with some way of not having to put the wood pellets in the bottom of the stove, but actually raise them and bring them closer to the top. So I, I have three different ways you can do that that I brought along to show you today. So the first one is a um, shower strainer. So this is go in your shower in, in your uh, tub for collecting, well, whatever, I guess would normally go down and you don't want it to go down the, the drain. It is made from stainless steel. This is a dollar store version. There are better versions out there, but I wanted to see this if this would work. And lo and behold, not only does it work well for holding pellets, but it is just the right size, and I'll demonstrate how I use it in a moment, to go down inside. What else did I come up with that will work? This is a fan guard for a computer, and yes, I've cut the ends off the where the screws would normally hold it on to the side of a computer case. But this is a fan guard, and these are very much available on the internet, especially through AliExpress and I imagine Amazon as well. And that will also fit down inside. And the holes or the grating is small enough to allow for wood pellets to sit on top of it. And the third alternative, and I actually quite like this one, is this is a skimmer, strainer for use with pots, maybe walks as well. Uh, there was a wire handle uh, welded to this and I just was able to work it off, cut it off with my Dremel tool and ended up with this nice, slightly scalloped dish thing that happens to be just the right size. And there are other versions. I've seen mesh or wired versions of this as well. So how do I use those items? So I have two alternatives here. First off, and what I use a lot of the time, are just skewers. These are stainless steel skewers I picked up at the dollar store and uh, cut them to size. And what I would do with them is just slide them through wherever I felt was the right height. Let's try here and here. And what's really nice is that, you know, you can put them any height you want. That's the whole nice thing about the IKEA strainers. You can put these at any number of heights and they will hold my screen guard at that level. My uh, straight, uh, strainer, a tub strainer or shower strainer at that level. And finally that skimmer, pot skimmer, and it will hold it wherever I wanted it, whatever level. So that has allowed me to use something, one of those three items for raising the level up closer to the top if I want to get my wood pellets and, and the fire closer to the pot so for better heat transmission, it works just fine. Alternative to the skewers, a couple of stainless steel tent pegs that I cut down to size so they will work and do exactly the same thing. Now these are going to come into play in a few more minutes time when I show you yet another way of using uh, these with something else. I'm going to put these in for a second because I want to show you. I think that's a, as good a spot as any. Okay, what about using an alcohol stove? So you can see I put the two of them in at a given height. That should be about right. I haven't actually measured this out to see which is the exact height what I want. So here is my Alex uh, alcohol burner similar to the Trangia stove and you need some way if you want to use this of supporting it close to the top of the stove. So what I have found is that by putting the two pegs through you can balance the stove on top of those two pegs and get the height you want to the crossbars when you put the crossbars on. It works. Uh, I haven't, like these ones won't work so that I can set it down. Other stoves will work so that you can get wires that will support this and then it's really nice and stable to use. Uh, yes, yeah, well let's just see if I can do that. Get exactly the height that I want. I suspect this is not as, will that work? No. That doesn't work. So let's try one more time to see if I can get it to where I want it to be. Will this work? Oh yes it does, but just barely. Okay, here's what I was trying to accomplish was to have the two skewers support the alcohol stove by the lip around the outside of it. It works, but I'm not really happy with that. So what's an alternative? Well, any one of these things that I showed you a minute ago 
can be used to set the pan on. Now I'd have to drop it down so it's to the correct height with the, with the crossbars. But any of these pans will work to support the alcohol stove at the height you want it to. Now, to another thing that you can do with these type of things is once you've got, if you have two sets of them, is you could use them across the top rather than a set of, of crossbars to support a pot. Now, a couple caveats to that. One is a small pot. And what I mean by small is something smaller than the diameter of the stove. Because if you put something large on, like this one, I'm going to completely cover off and prevent any airflow coming through the top of the stove. And that's just going to dampen the fire down dramatically and cause a lot of smoke. Even with all these holes on the side, it still dampens the fire down dramatically. So I can't recommend doing that with a large pot. Small pot, no problem at all. In fact, with a small pot, again, you can set these at any height you want and actually insert the pot, bringing it down to the level you want so that you're somewhat wind protected and you can bring it right down close to the pellets or, or alcohol stove or whatever else you have that's uh, generating heat inside there with these things. There is one alternative to the design of the stove which will allow you to put a large pot on top directly on top without any type of uh, support for it. And that is to actually cut a number of large ports all the way around the top with the last set of holes nearest the top so that there is room for air exhaust to leave the stove and uh, through the sides near the top. That will work and you'll, you'll reduce the amount of smoke and you'll concentrate the heat, except you are going to lose heat. To be honest, you are, you are going to lose heat out of the side. So it's not my preferred design. Plus, it's a whole lot of extra work that I'm not a, a fan of. One last thing I want to show you with these skewers placed inside again. I think that'll work just fine. I picked this up at the hardware store. This is an electrical box plate cover that you might use for, I don't know, well, an electrical box for, for certain, you know, around the house. Um, it's a little on the heavy side, so you don't have to use this. You could use something else like a piece of aluminum, not foil so much, but heavier uh, foil of some type. Placed in top, like as a solid plate, now I have something that I can use my esbit or gel fuel or something else on top of. I just point that out as a, an alternative if you're looking for something to do that with. I guess you could probably do it with that or with this with maybe some aluminum foil cup to hold it in place. This is aluminum flashing that I use under the stove when I'm on uh, surfaces that are a little suspect that may be a combustible just to provide a little protection I'll put that under for any hot coals or ashes falling through so a piece of aluminum flashing will work for this because it's not a high, high heat issue for using uh, something on top of that like a, a solid fuel okay I have covered a good number of ways or the, uh, the ways I, I have brought my hobo stove to its where it's at right now in design now, I'm going to take a minute and show you what I've done to take it to the next level. Okay, before I show you what I've come up with to take the IKEA Hobo stove to the next level, I just want to talk about where the idea came from. So, some time ago when I made a video, when I was comparing a couple of different stoves together, well, IKEA Hobo stoves, one of the things that I had discovered was just how much heat loss occurs out the sides of the IKEA Hobo stove because of all those holes. Those holes are an advantage from a design point of view, but not from a heat retention point of view. And if you have any crosswind at all, you lose a lot of heat out through the side. Now, simple aluminum, a uh, windscreen of some type will do a lot to preserve the heat so it's redirected upward and I'd recommend well it's with any wood stove it really doesn't matter what design wood stove with any wood stove if you have a windscreen you're going to retain more heat where it needs to be delivered which is to the bottom of whatever pot that you're using or pan that you're using to cook or heat water with so uh, that was something that really caused me to think about redesigning the hobo stove at the same time I had wondered what kind of performance I could get out of it, could I turn this into 
so let's say a wood gas stove, could I create pyrolysis to, to take effect inside and secondary combustion and cause a very clean, efficient wood burn that way? Because that's one of the most efficient design stoves as far as getting the most out of the fuel. There are other downsides to wood gas stoves we can talk about another time, but as far as the cleanest combustion and getting the most heat from the wood fuel that you have inside your wood your wood gas stove they're just about the best you can do the other design is a rocket stove and a rocket stove will work on a completely different principle than a wood gas stove but it also works to gain a lot of efficiency from the wood and generate a lot of heat delivering it right neat where it needs to be so I did try a number of combinations to see if I could turn the IKEA utensil strainer into a wood gas stove none of which worked very well what they did do, though, is they did um, improve performance because, of course, they were protecting the outer wall of the, of the hobo stove from losing heat and redirecting it upwards. No pyrolysis, no secondary combustion, but it did improve performance. So I refocused and thought, can I turn it into a rocket stove? Well, uh, I've come up with something that's close. Now, a true rocket stove needs a number of things uh, to be present for it to work to its very best. A true rocket stove works to start with on the chimney effect, so you need a stove design that is taller than it is wide, so that air can be drawn in through the bottom and being drawn up with that chimney effect, and along with it will the heat and the flame go. And if it's done right, you will actually get quite a, a forceful airflow through the top of the stove and you'll get a complete combustion and a lot of heat delivered. But it takes more than that to come up with a rocket stove. What you also need is some way of feeding wood into the rocket stove at the bottom, usually over some type of a platform or a feed ramp that will feed the wood in, allow combustion to occur underneath the wood, but only where it enters the stove. You don't want all the wood that's sticking out of the stove to be engaged with fire. So it's just a small portion of the wood that is engaged with the fire at that point, and that heat is is taken up the stove. Now the downside of most rocket stove designs is that in order to keep from losing heat out of the chimney there has to be some type of insulation around the outside of them. Uh, you know a lot of the rocket stove do that with uh, some type of a synthetic or perlite or cement or you know there's any number of things you can use. I, I could use or you could use uh, carbon felt to do the same thing but a lot of those add bulk and weight to the design of the stove making them less packable. Now if you didn't include any insulation it doesn't mean it still won't have a, a good effect on the stove it just means you're going to be losing some heat radiating out through the chimney. So unless it's insulated it's not really truly a rocket stove. Having said that, like I mentioned a second ago, you can get some really improved performance just by creating a higher stove that has more height and more draw of air going up through it. Now, are there any downsides to that type of design? Uh, potentially yes. One, you've just created a tall structure which by its very nature what might be, uh, well not top heavy but not quite so balanced. So it's easier to to knock over a rocket stove unless it has a very wide firm base on the bottom. A rocket stove can be a little tippy. So that is one downside. I think the design that I've come up with that I'm going to show you in a minute kind of it's the, just the best middle ground. So let me show you that now. All right, so what did I come up with? So what I did is I, I started looking for some type of a solid chamber that I could fit down over top of the IKEA, IKEA hobo stove that I could use to create a taller structure that would uh, create that rocket effect that I was looking for. And at the same time, prevent any or as much as possible heat loss out through the side. So again, I went back to the thrift store and I looked around and finally came across something which was a, well, it could have been a coffee canister, could have been a flour canister or sugar, I guess. I'm not sure what it was. So I picked up two of them. Now, this one cost me, this is strange. This one cost me $3.99. The other one that I bought, and I'm going to show you, only cost me $1.99. And they were must have came in at the same time, so I don't know how they ended up being priced differently. But uh, they were almost too good to be true. And the reason I knew it fit, well, one, I took the measurements with me. But at the same time, I also picked up another one of the strainers off of the shelf right next to them. And I could put one down over top of the other, and it works perfectly. So what did I do to modify this to make this work? 
Well, all I did is cut the bottom off. And that's all I did is just cut the bottom off it. Now, I will tell you that it was a little challenging to do. So um, I, you are able to do it with a Dremel tool or a cutoff wheel on a grinder. Uh, yeah, you could do it with a hacksaw, but if you're very careful, if, once you get inside, you could work your way around. I wasn't perfect getting it off, but uh, I was pretty good, I think, at, at making it as, as level as possible. And then I just smoothed off the edges so there wasn't any, uh, any sharp edges that I might catch myself on. And as you can see, I've been using it a fair amount, and well, here's how it works. So all I needed to do is remove the crossbars and place that down over the top, put the crossbars back on, and I had wind protection. Now, I wouldn't call this a rocket stove yet, or even have much of a rocket stove effect, but as it sits right now with the thing, or the, 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 the what, do you, what do you call it? Well, this container, anyway, this uh, goes right down to the bottom. So I've cut off airflow, but I'm going to show you how I fix that in a moment. And I, now I have about an inch and a quarter already over the top of the IKEA strainer. So I've, I've created a little bit more of a chimney. But of course, this isn't going to work just the way it is. So what did I have to do? Back to the skewers. So if I take the skewers and I place them through the bottom holes as close to the wall as I can get them. See how they're sticking out on both sides? Now place this over the top. I've lifted the, the uh, container off the ground and I've allowed airflow to come in around through the bottom row of holes here and of course in through the bottom. And immediately I started seeing an increase in performance because again, it was protected from side flowing winds and it was now starting to create that height that would allow for a greater chimney effect. Well, if I take that off, raise this up, and I'll just double the height of it here to show you where you can do with this. And there's really no limit to just how far you can go with this. Now I've created quite, I am about seven inches above the top of the IKEA utensil strainer. And my total structure now is running about uh, 13 inches tall. Uh, it's, now, it's still quite stable with the legs turned out like this. And I've regained my feed port if I wanted to start to feed wood in. This is where I really started to see some increase in performance. And there's no reason why I couldn't continue right up to the top set of holes and, and uh, play with it that way. Now, the further up I go, the less protection I have for air underneath. But, and the air draw, you want it to reach that balance between air drawn in through the bottom, you don't want to lose too much out through the side, and, uh, and, and, and drawn up through. So that's about where uh, the highest I like to go with this. So this works really well to create pretty much a rocket stove in performance. And again, it's missing the insulation, it's missing the feed ramp, but the increase in performance is quite dramatic. And how simple was that? buy a coffee canister or, or sugar or whatever this was originally, take the bottom off and it slides down inside. All you need to do is just find something that is the right size to do it. Okay, I think probably talking about it is not going to be sufficient. I think we need to get outside and test it. So let's do that. All right, so it's a beautiful day in my backyard laboratory. We're averaging just above the freezing mark, maybe one degree Celsius. So uh, light wind at the moment, but I can pick up any time. So that's the reason I have it, the stove set up in my little testing shelter that I built for it. So let's get this show on the road. So to just to save a little bit of time, I preloaded the IKEA utensil strainer with some split pieces of hardwood, some of which came from uh, my supplier for firewood and others just branches I had left over from projects out of the woods. I have set two of the tent stakes one hole up from the lowest hole so that when I do go to put the chimney on, it will be not all the way to the bottom, but not all the way up. There'll still be considerable depth to the chimney itself. I have the feet extended. Now it's just a matter of getting this started. Cheap, inexpensive fire starter today. I'm going for a top-down burn. Uh, you know, again, I, I say this often, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference in a lot of ways. I could have left the port exposed and fed sticks in. Uh, one of the nice things is when you do a preload like this, you don't have to do anything else for quite a while anyway. It depends on how long you want your fire to go. But So once I get the chimney on, I won't have to add any additional fuel. So the test will be, I'll get the... 
IKEA hobo stove going the way it, I would have used it before, adding the chimney to it. And uh, we'll wait and we'll have a look at the fire and see how that is performing. And then I'll drop the chimney down and give you some close-ups to see what difference the chimney makes on it. Now, the one factor that is going to be a little different from when I've done this before in the back area is the fact that I have these protections. So you won't see the wind robbing effect unless I cut in a clip from one of the other videos to show you just how hard that uh, the wind can actually pull the flame and the heat away from your stove. And I have a pot... Another inexpensive dollar store, not a dollar store, sorry, a thrift store find pot that I'll be using to boil some water, just a standard test to see what kind of performance we get there. Enough talking, let's get this show on the road. So I'll get this fire starter lit. Give that a second to catch. And then I'll start loading some wood chips on. That will create the fire you need on a top-down burn. A couple of the wood chips in here are actually from fat wood. So that'll actually help things go a little faster too. Get the fat wood lit. Only a couple chips of fat wood. I'm not going to run the video the whole time this is igniting. I just want to show you my lighting it and then I'll cut away and when it's fully engaged, let's get a few more chips on first. And then when it's fully engaged, I'll come back and show you the performance of the stove the way it is. And when it gets improved, so. All right, it will take a minute or two for that to really sink into the wood. And that's when I'll bring you back. All right, I thought I'd just give you a quick overhead view of the IKEA before I put the chimney on, just to give you an idea what the burn looks like inside. Uh, the wind is, again, very light at the time, but even so, I'm seeing the wind pull flames right out through the sides from time to time. All right, let's set up and put the chimney on. Now, if I just use gloved hands, um, I could probably put the chimney on no problem, but I found these incredibly useful. These are the Coglins pot grabbers that you can get for about two bucks, at least here in Canada. They're nice uh, to grab, well, pots and everything else, but they're also nice for grabbing stoves and chimneys and things like that. So let's put that on. It may not be immediately apparent to you, but it certainly is to me. I am seeing the flames reach even higher. I will be showing you in a minute what that looks like, and then we'll put the pot on to see what kind of a boil time we get. Ooh, totally smokeless. I can even hear the roaring noise that you expect to hear from a, from a rocket stove. All right, let me reposition the camera one more time. I'll give you a top-down view and then we'll put the water on. I definitely no wind dragging the flames out through the sides now. You can see the flames are just reaching up and when I give you the side view, they have to be reaching 10, 12 inches above the top of the chimney. I'm also seeing secondary combustion from the air being drawn in through the sides of the IKEA. I wouldn't call it pyrolysis, I wouldn't call it a wood gas stove, but it's certainly improving the performances. It's not losing any heat out the sides and adding heat to the top of the wood. All right, now let's position it on top and put the pot on. Get my pot on, and then I'll start a timer. So the crossbars, as I get my phone out, that is, the crossbars I have cut so that they will work on top of the IKEA or on top of uh, the chimney as well. So just by cutting the notches where it fits on top a little wider, and again, these are the ones made from the stainless steel rulers. No worry about them melting. Pot is on, flame is coming up and around the sides of it, and the timer is started. Maybe you can hear that if I lean in. The smoke you're seeing right now is from the uh, <laughs> soot on the side of the pot that's building up. The heat start, the flames are burning it off. It's not from the flames themselves. All right, what I'll do is I will cut away for a few moments and bring it back when that comes to boil and give you an idea what time, what, how much time it took. Oh yeah, hard rolling boil, two minutes, 20 seconds. That's a lot of heat. Let me take that off. I'm going to try and reposition the camera to give you an idea what it looks like down inside now. 
but the flames are reaching quite high, so I will have to be careful with my camera. So I have the camera supported a full, yeah, at least four feet above the flames and just zeroed in a little bit so you can see what's going on down inside. That wood is still being consumed at a phenomenal rate. I could have slowed it down a little bit if I had dropped the chimney right down to the bottom so that I minimize the airflow. And that's the nice thing about this is you can adjust the amount of airflow for a real strong rocket effect to a slow down effect because what's going to happen here is it's going to go through that wood and so quickly that it's going to leave very few coals once the flames go out. Uh, the dis well, That's fine in terms of fuel consumption and efficiency, but the uh, only issue with that is if you had planned on doing any grilling, you're going to lose all your coals or you'll have very few coals left at the end. You'll get to them quickly because it'll go through the wood quickly, but there won't be a lot left. All right, I think we have seen enough of this test. I think it shows the benefit of the chimney. Let's wrap this video up. All right, I think you'll agree from that uh, demonstration that there's a real performance benefit by adding that canister to the top of uh, the uh, Kia strainer to create a rocket stove effect. No, it's not a true rocket stove. It doesn't have the insulation around the chimney, but it does have a lot of the same performance that a rocket stove would have. It's not a wood gas stove, but at the same time, I did see some secondary combustion. No pyrolysis, but at least some secondary combustion, again, adding to the performance of the stove. So, when I opened this video up, I said that this was the ultimate design of the IKEA Hobo Stove. Is it? Do you have other ideas that you think I can improve upon this or something completely different that I'll get even more performance out of this stove? If you do, put them in the comments section below. But until we see each other again, get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.